This boy, ever since he was a child, was always beaten and humiliated by his own father, who was actually one of the biggest gang leaders in the region. After losing his temper, he left his father in a vegetative state and ended up in a juvenile detention center, where he will face the worst and most insane situations of his life. The story begins with a boy lying on the ground, his face covered in blood. From the shadow, we see a very strong man hitting him. Violence was a daily thing. My whole life, I grew up being beaten for no reason by someone who was supposed to be my father. To me, violence was as normal as breathing, he narrates. The scene then shifts to the boy, a bit older. He had a target on his face, desperately begging for it to stop. A man, with a rubber band and a coin, was ready to strike. Can't you just hit me normally? There's no need to do this to me, he pleads. The man responds. What? You don't want this? I thought you needed money. This blonde man's name was Kim Sung Ho. He was sentenced to two years in prison for sexual assault. You've done everything to make money so far. Shoveling snow for 301. Warming our shoes for 101. And for 201, you were a dog for a day. Now, being a human target, you'll earn 501, he says. Frightened, the protagonist responds, I'll do it. They were in a juvenile detention center, a kind of correctional facility. There, all the juvenile criminals of South Korea, under 19 years old, were gathered. Violence and crimes happen daily. You better squeeze your eyes shut so they don't pop out. Kim Song Ho advises, it'll be funny if this ends up lodged in your forehead. Suddenly, the rubber band snaps and the coin hits the bathroom door, falling into the toilet. Damn it, do you guys have another rubber band? One of the inmates yells. Rubber bands are really rare around here, another replies. You got lucky this time. Cha Ju Young, says Kim Sung Ho. Our protagonist, Cha Ju Young, runs to the toilet. There's no way he's going to grab the coin from the toilet, one of the inmates comments. Kim Sung Ho says, if you really want that coin, you'll have to get it with your mouth. Cha Ju Young looks at the coin in the toilet, while the others laugh at him. Someone had massive diarrhea there yesterday, one of the inmates comments. Without thinking twice, Cha Ju Young puts his face in the toilet. Gross, exclaims a prisoner. Boss, isn't it time for the hack now? Asks an inmate. Already. Hey kid, you better get out of there slowly, since you smell like crap, says Kim Sung Ho. The inmates laugh at Cha Ju Young. He's an idiot, they say. He's become like this in just a month. Even without money, I think he's given up on being human. He's here for attempted murder, comments an inmate. Cha Ju Young, attempted murder, sentenced to three years in prison, says another. Murder is nothing compared compared to making money, says the boss. Why is he so obsessed with money? Does he have some debt? They ask. A guard appears. Number 70 at 199. Cha Ju Young, you have a visitor. Cha Ju Young is surprised. Visitor? He asks. The reason I'm saving money is because, he begins, but is interrupted. The scene shifts to a girl with short hair and a red scarf, resembling Annie from Attack on Titan. Why is your face so thin? Are these idiots not feeding you, or are you getting beaten up here? She asks. She is Dawn, Cha Ju Young's childhood friend. You really are an idiot. I told you that first impressions matter. Didn't I say not to stab someone in the eye right away? She says. Why do you visit me so often? There's no need to waste money, he responds. Irritated. She says, you think I'm a beggar? Tell me, what's with these coins? Where did you get the money to send them to me? Even without a father, I don't accept suspicious money. Why did you bring this back? He asks. Because of our promise to live together in Seoul when we graduate from high school. I've already saved the money. So take care of yourself, she replies. A guard appears. Visiting hours are over. Dawn stands up. I hope you understand me. Think about being released as soon as possible and never give up on yourself. That's a promise, right? The protagonist can only wave goodbye to her, but the further she walks away, the more depressed he becomes, thinking only about the promises he made. The scene shifts to the protagonist and the girl sitting in what looks like a hospital. He says, my dad, because of this film, he ended up, well, never mind. The girl, all bruised and dirty, responds, what? What are you saying? Are you kidding me? She slaps the protagonist and says, Aren't you at all worried about me? Your dad is in a coma after being hit by the flower pot you swung. If he never wakes up, the police won't let you off so easily. The protagonist, also injured, replies, It's fine. Considering the domestic abuse I've endured, the punishment won't be too severe. The scene shifts to the courtroom, and the judge declares, Cha Ju Young, this court sentences you to three years in prison. This leaves the protagonist in shock. He is outraged, being imprisoned for retaliating just once after a lifetime of his father's violence. Why? did no one do anything, he thinks. The scene then shifts to the protagonist already in prison, and the girl says, make sure not to miss your meals, and let me know if anyone bothers you in there. Got it. That's a promise, right? The protagonist just turns his face and goes to his cell. Even if someone in this prison causes trouble, the sentence would be extensive. But if a prisoner behaves, their sentence can be reduced, he thinks. The protagonist is sitting on the floor, contemplating that he will spend three years of his life there, looking at a photo of his friend. He says, let's wait out these three 
three years. However, that blonde guy shows up and says, Wow, pretty girl, huh? Is she your girlfriend? The protagonist responds, No, she's just a friend of mine. The blonde guy says, Oh, unrequited love, huh? I get it. Hand over that photo now. The protagonist responds, What? My photo? No, I'm not giving you my photo. The blonde guy says, Oh, look at this. The kid's trying to act tough, huh? The man then prepares to attack the protagonist, saying he needs to be corrected immediately. However, just as he's about to beat the protagonist, a guard appears and says, Dormitory 36, you have a new inmate. The blonde guy says, Oh, fresh meat, huh? The guard introduces inmate 3 397. The new inmate doesn't look like someone you want to mess with. The guard then says, Please, I'm begging you not to cause any trouble. We'll be watching everything you do. The inmates comment, That guy, I think I know him. Isn't he the one who killed seven delinquents at his school? His name is Ma Joan. Ma Joan, murder of seven people, sentenced to 20 years in prison, someone says. That's the longest sentence in the juvenile court. Everyone in the place is in shock. Did he really kill seven people? They wonder. Kim Sung Ho says, You guys are such wimps. Huh, idiots. Who cares if he killed seven or a thousand people? Is there anyone here who isn't as bad as him? Just look at that ridiculous face, and you can tell he's a wild beast. Really, you have a very fitting appearance for a killer. But let's not get cocky here. Make sure to behave. Got it. Kim extends his hand to Ma Joon. Ma Joon just looks at the hand and turns his back on him. Kim Sung Ho gets angry and says, I thought this would go smoothly. But it seems this bastard is really an idiot. He prepares to punch Ma Joon in the back. However, at high speed, Ma Joon dodges the blow, leaving everyone very surprised. Kim Sung Ho wonders, How did that bastard dodge my blow with his back turned? Ma Joon prepares to punch Kim Sung Ho in the face. The protagonist thinks he's different. A person who killed seven people is really different. However, just as Ma Joon's hand is about to reach Kim Sung Ho's face, Kim Sung Ho retaliates much faster, landing a full punch on Ma Joon's face, making him spit blood. This guy is really tough, huh? Kim Sung Ho starts kicking him repeatedly, saying, You damn bastard, know your place and recognize who's the boss here. The scene changes, and Kim Sung Ho is hitting Ma Joon on the head, saying, Go get water for all of us. Despite everything, Ma Joon continues to refuse to be anyone's subordinate. The inmates keep beating him. The protagonist thinks, How did he manage to learn to do everything wrong here? Even a pig being sent to the butcher wouldn't be this mute. It seems I'm the one who's going to have a very tough life here because of a useless fish. Night falls, and everyone is asleep. Ma Joon's face is swollen and bruised from the beatings. The protagonist then calls out to him and says, Are you an idiot? Is it that hard to appease the boss a little? Even if he's a piece of trash, he's the boss and the king of the prison, or at least this dormitory. So it's natural for us to shut up and do what he says. It's better not to get so worked up when you can't even fight back. Just do what he says, starting tomorrow. Ma Joon responds, Kid, have you really always lived so submissively? After saying this, he just turns over and goes to sleep. The protagonist thinks, What is he talking about? He gave me advice. Have I really been living my whole life so submissively? But I have to keep doing this, at least until I get out of here. The scene shifts to the protagonist's friend, Dayon, who comments, It's really cold, and Ju Young seems to have lost a lot of weight. Should I pack some food for him? Considering his situation, he can't talk about it, but he's probably going through a really tough time in there. He should at least eat well. A lunchbox for him in this situation is nothing, but he'll be really touched by my gesture, right? Da Yon, very happy, starts crossing the street. However, suddenly, our relentless truck Kun appears, just as the truck is about to hit her. The scene shifts to Ju Young, sleeping peacefully in his bed. But when the scene returns to Da Yon, she is completely covered in blood, and her lunchbox is scattered on the street. The scene shifts back to the prison, where a guy says, My condolences to you. The protagonist asks what he means, and the guard responds, Well, kid, there was a car accident at the intersection in front of the prison. What I'm saying is that your friend has passed away. With these words, the protagonist's mind is shattered. Ju Young is filled with so much rage that it shows on his face. Kim Sung Ho arrives, calling him an idiot, and says, You didn't clean the bathroom today. Are you losing it because of what happened to you? Don't tell me you're looking at your crush's photo first thing in the morning. One of the inmates comments, There was an accident this morning in front of the prison, and it seems the girl in that photo got into it. Kim Sung Ho says, Oh, no way, seriously. So the girl who got in the accident was your little girlfriend, the one who always visited you here. Huh? Why were you lying then, you poor idiot? What are you going to do now that your girlfriend is dead? Kim Sung Ho snatches the photo from the protagonist's hand and says, She was pretty cute, wasn't she? What a waste, right, kid? Hey, any of you want this photo? Let's start the bidding at 500 won. That price is dirt cheap. The protagonist starts remembering Ma Joon's words, asking if he had really always lived so submissively. Ju Young thinks, This is a limited edition of me now. He gets 
gets up and simply punches Kim Sung Ho in the face, knocking him to the ground with great force, which shocks all the prisoners around. Kim Sung Ho's face is completely smashed into the ground, even surprising Ma Jung. In a flashback, Ju Young tells Ma Jung, My father was the right-hand man of a successful gang leader. From a young age, I was beaten daily by that bastard. But what could I do? Even though I was beaten every day, I had to live with him because he was my father. But there was one situation, one time, when I couldn't take it anymore. It was when my father tried to threaten my friend. Back to the present. Kim Sung Ho's face is completely bloodied. Everyone lunges at the protagonist. At least, from being beaten to death by my father's scum, I learned this properly, Ju Young thinks. He begins to defeat them one by one, while Kim Sung Ho is impressed by his fighting skills. The scene shifts, and everyone is on the ground, unconscious and bloody. Kim Sung Ho, on his knee, begs, Please, don't kill me. I'll give you all my money. You want money? I can give you as much as you need. Just say the word. Ju Young responds, Money. Money is really good. But now I don't need that crap anymore. He starts beating Kim Sung Ho again, saying, The reason I did all this, humiliated myself for you all, and held back until now doesn't exist anymore. The scene shifts, and we see Ju Young, beaten up on the ground. He remembers his father's words, Follow in my footsteps, and become a real gangster. His father said this, while beating him every day. This cycle of daily aggression started when I was very young, and I couldn't even look my father in the eye. But I always thought I had to become the strongest of all. To this day, I have this tattoo engraved on my body. It was the only direction my anger could go, toward the eyes of the dragon. The scene shows Ju Young running toward his father, extremely angry. His father comments, I like your eyes. The scene cuts back to the present, where some guards enter the cell and are horrified by what they see. What did the protagonist do here? Ju Young, with a completely changed expression, says, Yes, I did this. The scene shifts to Ju Young sitting in a cell, looking smaller than usual, just staring at a photograph completely stained with blood. He remembers his friend, who used to say, Has your father gone mad? What kind of father hits their child on the first day of high school? This is too much, even for the biggest lunatic. He should have been there to congratulate you. Ju Young responds, Don't worry, this isn't the first time this has happened to me. She, irritated, asks, Are you okay? How can this not be the first time? This can't continue. I'll have to talk seriously with your father about this. He promised me. Ju Young grabs her arm and says, Never go to my house. If you do, you'll be breaking your own promise. Da Yun would have to stop calling him my friend. The girl then becomes a bit sentimental, saying that he really doesn't understand these things because he's never had a real home. Ju Young responds, No, relax. I didn't mean it like that. Da Yun then says, After high school graduation, I'm thinking of moving to Seoul. I'm tired of living in this damn orphanage, and this small neighborhood suffocates me. I'm thinking of going to Seoul, graduating from a decent university, getting a job at a big company, driving a foreign car, carrying luxury bags, and living in an apartment with a view of the Han River. Ju Young asks, have you always been this materialistic? He starts to think that if she really goes there, he will be alone in this life forever. But Da Yon responds, actually, I would like you to come with me too. That would be amazing for me. She then takes Ju Young's hand and says, will you really come with me? They pinky swear and say, this is a promise. She adds, if you don't keep your promise, you'll have to call me Nona for the rest of your life. Ju Young responds that he doesn't agree with that. Suddenly, a strange man appears, saying they make a lovely couple and asks if he can take a picture of them. When Ju Young is about to say they aren't a couple, Da Yon responds that yes, he can take the picture. The man takes the photo that Ju Young always looks at. Back in the present, Ju Young punches the cell wall, leaving a handprint on it. He starts blaming himself, saying that all this is his fault. If he hadn't done what he did to his father and ended up in prison, maybe Da Yon would still be alive since she wouldn't have needed to visit him in this filthy place. Ju Young starts punching the wall repeatedly, crying and apologizing while looking at the photo. A guard appears and says, Kid, I'm sorry for your unfortunate situation, but I can't overlook what you did in the cell. You didn't even touch your food yesterday, so try to calm down and at least eat a little. Life has to go on. You can't stay in this state forever. Ju Young falls to his knees, crying and apologizing for being a complete failure. The scene shifts to the cafeteria, where everything seems normal. The inmates are eating and talking. Did you hear the rumors? One of them asks. What rumors? The other responds. They say the guy's name is Cha Ju Young. He beat everyone in his room and was sent to a punishment cell. Another inmate asks, why would that kid do that? The first inmate responds, apparently, the room leader mocked the death of his girlfriend, who recently died in a car accident. The inmates find this amazing, as the situation is refreshing for them. Ma Joan is just listening to all these rumors. Suddenly, a man next to Ma Joan stands up. One of the inmates says, does that mean we have a new leader now? The man then grabs the inmate's head and smashes it into his food tray. He says, what are you all talking about with 
without me. You seem to be having a lot of fun. Don't mind me. Let me join the conversation too. This guy's name was Park Jongchen, imprisoned for special assault. He says, so you're saying this guy became the leader by rebelling, and that's refreshing. Then tell me, why are you all trying to leave me out? All the inmates at the table are shocked by his words. Park Jongchen asks the man whose face he just smashed into the food. And you, are you okay? The man responds, crying, sorry, Jongchen, I really shouldn't have said that. Park Jongchen says, so the bastard's name is Cha Ju Young, huh? The scene shifts to a week later. One of the guards says to Ju Young, the leader you beat up is still in the hospital. What kind of punch was that? You left him in a coma. The guard continues, we're going to let you out in a week, considering your current situation. So, it's best not to cause any more trouble for us. Ju Young returns to his cell, but his expression has completely changed, showing a smug look. Manjoon thinks, he took down the room leader. Now, the guys here won't welcome him warmly today, but what can I do to help this kid? Suddenly, one of the inmates stands up, catching Ju Young's attention, and asks if he's okay since he went through a tough time. All the inmates surround Ju Young, asking if he's okay, and if it was hard to endure the punishment in the small room. Some offer to massage his shoulders and fetch water for him. Ju Young's life had truly turned around. See? Violence solves everything. Folks, just kidding. Don't take that seriously. Ma Joan was writing in his notebook. Recently, I've realized something at school. Parents, appearance, and grades are very important factors. But here, at the juvenile detention center, strength is everything. The scene shifts to the detention yard, and Ju Young calls out to Ma Joan. Ju Young asks, why did you do that? Ma Joan doesn't understand what he means. Ju Young continues, that day, when I tried to kill that room leader bastard, you stopped me. It's ironic to be stopped by someone who came here for killing seven people. So, why did you stop me in that situation? Especially since that guy was tormenting you too. I'd like to hear from you why you stopped me. We see a flashback of Ma Joan, with his hands, feet, and body covered in blood, standing next to several dead people on the ground, wondering, what am I doing on earth? When Ma Joan is about to answer Ju Young, a man arrives and says, so you're Cha Ju Young? You look a lot smaller than I thought. How did someone as short and weak as you manage to beat Kim? That guy must have been a piece of trash to lose to you. But answer me this, kid, why did you do it? Why did you rebel against him? Are you so desperate to take the room leader's place? Or is there another reason? Ju Young responds, you're wasting your time. I really don't care about that. If I lose this position, so be it. The man laughs and says, kid, you have a shitty way of talking to others, don't you? You know what I hate most about people? Arrogant folks like you, who don't know their place. Let me teach you something. The man punches Ju Young in the stomach, grabs his head, and prepares to punch his face, saying, what happens to the dog that dares bite its owner? Before he can land the punch, a guard appears by the bars, and the man stops, saying it was just a joke between friends. The guard says, kid, you know the rules. As the room leader, you can fight as much as you want under the guise of maintaining order. That's one of the rules of this juvenile detention center. The man starts beating Ju Young, who doesn't fight back, leaving Ma Joan impressed. Park Jongchen throws Ju Young against the cell bars and says, you're so weak you can't even hit me back. Beating you up isn't fun at all. As he rolls up his sleeves, a dragon tattoo is visible on his arm. Ju Young remembers the beatings from his father and the dragon tattoo on his father's chest. Park Jongchen says, by the way you talk, it seems like you're not afraid of anything. Don't tell me you did all this because of that shitty truck accident. At the mention of the accident, Ju Young kicks Park Jongchen in the face, throwing him to the ground and twisting his arm behind his back. Park Jongchen asks how Ju Young managed to do that. Ju Young, very serious, says, repeat what you just said. Park Jongchen can only wonder, who the hell is this bastard? Ju Young starts kicking Park Jongchen's head repeatedly, who screams desperately for him to stop. Ju Young says, you're dead this time. He grabs Park Jongchen's tattooed arm and, without mercy, brutally breaks it. Ju Young says, since I was young, the only direction for my anger was the eyes of that damn dragon. The scene shifts to two women gossiping. I heard that kid's father is a gangster. The other replies, it seems that child is bullying someone and will be a bad influence on the neighborhood. Ju Young says, stay calm. This is what I was always best at. As the protagonist approaches his house, he begins to hear several screams from a different voice inside. He runs towards the door and opens it as quickly as possible. Upon opening the door, he sees his father in an intimidating pose, with everything in the house in disarray, and a girl lying on the floor. The protagonist's father says, well, son, you arrived just in time. Is this girl your friend? The girl on the floor was Dayon. The boy's father then says, she entered someone else's house and made bold remarks. She said if I touched you again, she would deal with me. So, I had to reprimand her a little. Ju Young tries to stay as calm as possible, controlling his rage, as his best quality was keeping calm in situations like this. His father continues, tell this little girl that if she repeats this again, I'll send her back to where 
where her real parents are. At that moment, Ju Young loses control of his anger and charges at him with everything he has. Ju Young didn't just hit his father, he brutally massacred him. After that day, his father ended up in a vegetative state. The scene shifts to Ju Young's father lying in a vegetative state. He has little chance of waking up again unless a miracle happens, says a doctor. Ju Young can only look at the dragon tattoo on his father's chest and sigh, saying, All right, it seems it finally came to an end. Back in the present at the prison, all the inmates watch what Ju Young had done. He's really crazy. He just got out of that cell and already wants to go back, they comment. Ju Young looks at the shattered body of the man while observing his tattoo. Then, the guards announce, Exercise time is over. Prisoners, please return to your rooms. From a high window, someone observes all the prisoners and comments. Isn't it a bit too noisy out there? Another responds, Maybe it's because this is the place where many energetic kids gather. A man says, By the way, I'm glad you look healthy. I heard you just got out of the hospital, right? If you have any inconvenience, feel free to let me know, and I'll do my best for you. This man's name was Quan Changxia, the director of the juvenile prison. Quan Changxia asks, Who are you here to see? And then smiles. The scene shifts to Ju Young's cell, where all the other inmates are on their knees, nervous in his presence. Ma Zhong writes in his diary that it has been an absurd month and says, I think I'm going to stay in this room with a really crazy guy. Suddenly, a guard calls Ju Young, asking him to come to the door because he has a visitor, which surprises him since the only person who visited him was Da Young. In the corridor, Ju Young wonders, who could be visiting me? My mother passed away when I was very young, and all my relatives abandoned me. Who could it be? They arrive at the prison director's office, and Ju Young wonders why he's there. A man in the shadows says, it's been a long time, hasn't it, since we last saw each other. Ju Young looks at the man and can only think of his father, with his imposing and sinister figure. The man continues, it was really interesting to watch you do all this lie. My dear son, the name of Ju Young's father is Cha Gangryong. Ju Young can't believe that his wretched father is still alive, but as they say, a bad penny always turns up. The man beside Ju Young starts mocking him. You look really surprised by this, huh? Why aren't you happy to see your father? What matters is that he woke up miraculously not long ago. And that's really fortunate, isn't it? Thank God, your father is alright. Ju Young remembers someone saying that his father could only wake up by a miracle, and the chance of that happening was very slim. He is outraged, still wondering how his father is standing right in front of him. Gangryung continues, You still don't believe what you're seeing, do you? I'm the right hand of the organization, and no one has been able to do this to me. Not even the police. But who would have thought? Right. My weak little boy managed to do this to me. When I opened my eyes, I realized I was in the hospital and felt very sad about it. Out of nowhere, Gangryung starts crying and says, I'm very sad with you, Ju Young. As a father, I want to see you because I love my own son very much. There's nothing I can do for you at this moment, so I had no choice but to kill her. Ju Young is confused by what he says. The scene shifts to Da Young's accident when she was hit by the truck. In front of her appears Ju Young's father. He approaches and says, You said it was better not to have a father like me, didn't you? But fathers should do everything for their children. Thinking about it, little girl, it seems you still don't understand this since you never had parents from the beginning. Back to the present, the protagonist's father says, Well, I thought you were just a pathetic son who could only endure everything and stay calm and quiet. But this was the first time in my life that I saw you do something worthwhile. And that little girl was the trigger for it. So, let's say this, my son. I tried to eliminate her. I went back to that path, and I finished her off. I did all this for your own good, my son. Without a second thought, Ju Young rises in a fury, ready to smash his father's face again. However, he gets shot with some darts. The electric shock from the tasers hits him, and he collapses to the ground. His father approaches and says, Do you really want your revenge by killing your own father? Then let me tell you something, my naive boy. I'll tell you the only way to kill me. Some of our members are here in the juvenile prison now. They've barely got their new tattoos, but some of them will likely become the pillars of my organization in the future. Prove that you're better than all these kids and take control of this entire juvenile prison. If you rise so high and earn everyone's recognition, someday you might be able to take me down. Ju Young's father continues, surpass me as the second in command and prepare to face the celestial dragon. This way, you will achieve what I, your father, never could in my entire life. If you really manage to accomplish all this, my life will be completed because of you. The protagonist's father then asks a man to take care of his son, and the man responds that it's no problem, he will do it. Suddenly, the officers with the taser guns can't control Ju Young anymore. He simply grabs the shock cords and prepares to charge at his father. Ju Young says, Stop spouting this nonsense to me, you old fool. Rest assured, I will kill you. The guards surrounding the protagonist were astonished as he managed to stand up. Ju Young, with bloodshot eyes, was solely focused on killing his father right then and there. He began to 
recall everything his father had said about the organization, his life, and taking control of the Celestial Dragon. If I do all this, my father's life will be complete because of me, thought the protagonist. He repeatedly told his father to stop talking nonsense, because he was definitely going to kill him today. Just as Ju Young's punch was about to connect with his father's head, a man appeared, grabbing the protagonist's head. In truth, Ju Young didn't even see the man approaching. The man said, forgive me for being rude, young master. He then slammed Ju Young's head into the ground with great force. This is my duty to serve the boss, the man continued. His face was revealed. A madman with reddish or brown hair, hard to distinguish due to the light, and a giant X-shaped scar on his face. The man thought he had knocked out Ju Young, but he began trying to get up. The man said, do you really think the strength of the Celestial Dragon's commander can be withstood by the legs of a spoiled brat like you? Ju Young's father spoke. My poor son, open your eyes wide and look around. There were numerous mafiosos surrounding Ju Young. You still don't understand your situation. In your current state, you will never reach me. Reckless actions like yours only mess things up. The only way to kill me is to take control of this entire prison. I will keep moving forward until we meet again, my dear son. They all turned and left Ju Young on the ground. With intense hatred in his heart, Ju Young slowly got up. The scene shifted to a wooden room where Ma Joan was working on a bench. A guard appeared and said, You've met today's quota, 3D 397. You can take it a bit easier. Ma Joan responded that he understood. Other prisoners watched and commented on Ma Joan's insane and incredible hammer skills, noting that he had smashed the heads of some bullies. They continued discussing Ma Joan, saying he didn't give off the vibe of a cold, calculating killer who had murdered seven people in cold blood. Suddenly, a prisoner appeared with a toolbox. Another inmate said, Good thing you brought it. Put it on the shelf now. The tattooed man with the toolbox, with tattoos on his neck and face, dropped the box on the floor. The others asked, Why did you do that? Drop such a good toolbox? The man replied, Sorry, I guess my hand lost a bit of strength. He observed one of the nails that fell from the box, and Ma Joan also looked at the nail with a serious expression. The tattooed man said, Pretty amazing, right? You're very impressive, Ma Joan. It's been a long time since we graduated high school. The tattooed man's name was Yoon Gun Min, imprisoned for theft and arson. Gun Min said, I saw it in the news. We've met again, my old friend. Do you remember who I am? Ma Joan responded. There's no way I could forget you, Yoon Gun Min. Gun Min said, I always wanted to ask you. That news saying you killed seven people is really strange. Did you actually do it? Honestly, I can't believe that Ma Joan from school did that. Ma Joan seemed to get very angry at what he was saying. Ma Joan asked, What do you mean by that? Gun Min responded, It means nothing special. You were always an exemplary student since childhood. I found it strange what happened to you. The guard interrupted the conversation and told Gun Min to return to his cell. Gun Min said, Sure, sure, I'm going back. Hey, Ma Joan, see you later. It was really nice to see you again. As Gun Min left, Ma Joan looked at a piece of wood he was gripping tightly and saw his hand was bloody with a nail embedded in it. The scene shifted to the protagonist's cell. Ju Young was sitting on the floor, thinking about everything that had happened today. He remembered his father's words, saying that the only way to kill him was to take control of this prison. Ju Young realized that this was indeed the only way to kill the man he called his father. He wondered, okay, I know what I have to do, but where should I start? The protagonist began observing the behavior of everyone around him. The prisoners were complaining that they were so hungry they could die, as the menu only had vegetables. One inmate commented, well, we should report this as a human rights violation, shouldn't we? Another laughed and said, forget all that, man. But honestly, I just wish for a slice of pizza. Man, I would die happy. Another prisoner then said, Did you forget you're in prison? To me, that's a dumb wish. Upon hearing the word, wish, the protagonist started reflecting on it. Suddenly, a guard approached and the prisoners fell silent. The protagonist's eyes, while very empty, were full of hatred. He stood up and said, Hey, officer. The officer asked, What's wrong? Any problems? The prisoners wondered why Ju Young was talking to the guard out of the blue. Ju Young said, There's a very specific problem. Could you get me a pizza? Neither the guard nor the prisoners could believe what Ju Young was asking for. The officer responded, Number 7199, have you forgotten you're in a prison? You better watch your attitude and get out of my sight. However, the scene cuts, and all the inmates are extremely happy in their cell, eating two gigantic pizzas. The prisoners are thrilled with Ju Young's bold move. One of them comments that he hasn't had outside food in a long time, and another says he's so happy he could cry. The inmates start thanking Ju Young profusely. The protagonist thinks, I really couldn't believe it at first, but the warden and the guards in this prison are under my father's influence. He remembers the warden's words about being relieved that his father was safe and his father telling them to take good care of his son. The warden assured him not to worry. Ju Young realizes, indeed, they're all taking special care of me. This man's son
son gets very special treatment, unlike the others. So, I really need to start testing the limits of what I can do in this prison. One of the prisoners says, Ju Young, or rather, Mr. Ju Young, who are you really? Is your father someone in Congress? Are you a third generation keyball? The protagonist remains silent, thinking only that he will get his revenge no matter what it takes. But he mustn't forget, he's the son of that detestable man. Ju Young then wonders, okay, but why is Ma Joan acting this way? Ma Joan was isolated from all the other prisoners. One of them asks, hey, Ma Joan, why aren't you eating the pizza? Another inmate says, leave him alone, man. He's been acting strange all day, much more melancholic today. Did something happen to him? Ma Joan was sitting in the corner with his head down. The scene shifts to the protagonist and Ma Joan packing some items. Suddenly, Yoon Gun Min appears behind Ma Joan with another toolbox and several nails. He says, oops, I think my hand slipped again. Man, he drops a bunch of nails on Ma Joan, who looks horrified. Gun Min says, sorry, Ma Joan, my hands have been really greasy lately. Ma Joan glares at Gun Min with intense hatred and asks, what the hell are you trying to do to me? What is this? Yoon Gun Min, this is very different from what you said to me. Some prisoners surround Ma Joan and say, look, he's glaring at you. So, does this mean a top level assassin is my subordinate? Oh, I've been so eager to see this, so it was all a lie. That he was a famous bully in the neighborhood. Gun Min starts laughing maniacally and says, damn, it was just a lie, right? Since childhood, Ma Joan, do you remember how well you took care of me? Or have you forgotten everything? Let's see if this will jog your memory. Gun Min grabs Ma Joan's head and pushes it toward a nail. As Ma Joan's head is about to be pierced by the nail, we flash back to Ma Joan begging Gun Min to stop. The scene changes to Ma Joan's desperate, tearful face as Gun Min tortured him at school, locked in a cabinet full of piercing nails. Gun Min, with a psychopath smile, says the game is just beginning and starts hammering the box Ma Joan was trapped in, counting down. Back to the present, Gun Min says, so, do you remember now? He stops Ma Joan's face just inches from the nail, nearly piercing his eye. All the other prisoners mock Ma Joan, saying he looked like a scared little girl. Gun Min grabs several nails and says, did you really believe this cowardly bastard killed seven people? He wouldn't even have the guts to kill a fly. Just as Gun Min was about to torture Ma Joan further, Ma Joan tightly grasps Gun Min's arm, causing the nails to fall. All the prisoners and Gun Min are shocked by his reaction. Ma Joan says, do you really want me to show you how I kill someone? Just as things are about to escalate, a guard appears and announces that break time is over and everyone must return to their places. Gun Min pulls his hand away and warns the others not to touch him. The other prisoners say it was fun to watch, but Gun Min is not satisfied. He thinks Ma Joan is still a big idiot. The scene shifts to the cell, where the prisoners debate who would win in a fight, Jesus or Buddha. One prisoner says, of course, it's Jesus, right? Another responds, you don't know anything. I watched Record of Ragnarok, and obviously, Buddha wins. A third prisoner says, Jesus gave us chocolate pie. How can you say Buddha wins? And another replies, Buddha gave us hamburgers. Is there anything better than hamburgers? The two stand up, nearly coming to blows. Another prisoner says, relax, guys, this is a religious war. Let's do some religious activities instead. In another corner of the cell, Ju Young and Ma Joan sat silently. Ju Young said, thank you. Ma Joan, confused. Ma Joan asked, thank you for what? Ju Young replied, thank you so much for stopping me back then. I really could have ended up here for another decade of my life. Ma Joan then asked, good boy, you asked me why I stopped you. Why did you ask that? The protagonist responded, well, I have a big reason to leave this place. The person who killed my friend, I will find him. And that person is my father. Ma Joan responded, but you said your father was in a vegetative state. The protagonist then said, it's a long story, and thanks to you, I'll be able to get out of here quickly. Thank you so much. Ma Joan, incredulous, said, are you mocking me? How can you say that in front of someone who was sentenced to 20 years in prison? The protagonist replied, no, man, relax, that's not what I meant. Ma Joan said, well, in any case, I really will pay my debt. The scene then shifted to the storage room again. The supervisor handed a key to Ma Joan and said, my apologies, but I have a very important matter to attend to at home, so I need to rush back. Please, Ma Joan, clean this room and good luck. Ma Joan noticed a moth on the table and, remembering Yoon Gun Min, we had a flashback. At 11 years old, Yoon Gun Min said, look, friend, do you see this? You did all this for me. It's great. Ma Joan replied, man, I don't like insects because they're gross, moths and butterflies included. It was said that Gun Min was Ma Joan's first friend. The scene then changed to school, where some guys talked about Gun Min. Who is this Gun Min? He's so weird, just collecting insects like a gross idiot. One of the teenagers approached Gun Min and said, Hey, you idiot, are you collecting those to eat later? Gun Min, awkwardly, tried to explain that it wasn't the case, but the guy continued, Oh, right, so you're making it your protein supplement, huh? But tell us, 
Are you really going to eat that? Ma Joan intervened, telling them to stop. I know it's free time, but go back to your places now. The guy said, he's the class president. He's definitely going to give us penalty points. Let's keep quiet. They apologized. Sorry, president. We'll take a break for now. Ma Joan asked Gun Min if he was okay. And Gun Min, happy, said, do you remember you were coming to my house today? Just then, the guys in the room invited Ma Joan to play the new video game together. Thinking of Gun Min, Ma Joan said, well, I already have plans today. The guys replied. President, you're not going to play with us, but it's okay. It was mentioned that they would be separated the next year, would have different classes, and had fewer days to hang out together. The scene shifted to Ma Joan walking down the street, where some people commented about gunmen. Hey, did you hear the rumor about gunmen? I heard he's being heavily bullied at school. Another responded, It's true, I've seen him get hit before. Another commented, I heard he was taken to the warehouse. This made Ma Joan worried. He ran desperately to the warehouse to help his friend. When he got there and opened the Door. He saw several guys waiting for him, but there was no sign of gunmen. Suddenly, gunmen appeared behind him with a psychopath smile and said, Oops, my old friend, I'm right here. He pushed Ma Joan into the warehouse and said, Shut up now, you just need to stay very quiet inside this box. He locked Ma Joan inside a cabinet. The other guy said, Collecting the insects was really a success. I told you this guy was an idiot. So, gunmen, you want to join our gang, but you have to offer your favorite insects. Ma Joan, desperate, shouted to be let out and wondered why Gunmin was acting so different all of a sudden. Gunmin said, Wait a minute there, my friend. He began hammering the box Ma Joan was trapped in and started a countdown. Back to the present, Gunmin said, They're the same insects, but everyone loves butterflies. I just think moths are gross and they're like how I used to be. Gunmin crushed a butterfly and said, This is all because of you. Ma Joan wondered why it was all his fault. Gunmin replied, Don't play dumb. You thought I wouldn't notice you were pretending to be nice to me, acting like you were my big friend while slowly distancing yourself to betray me. In your popular head, I was just a gross moth, and you were the butterfly everyone liked at school. From the moment I realized that, it got harder to stay by your side each day. And do you know why I became like this? Because of you. I'm the only one who was affected by your actions. When I heard the news that you killed seven people, let's just say I lost my mind. But is this karma or something like that? Ma Joan gets very irritated and asks, What do you mean by that? Just as Ma Joan was about to call gunmen an idiot, gunmen in interrupts and says, well, it doesn't matter anymore, since your mediocre life is ruined anyway, my dear friend. Some guys show up and restrain Ma Joan, covering his mouth to prevent him from screaming. Gunmin says, well, now my friend, you're going to be crushed to dust. The guys comment, ever since you bought off Warden Mio, you weren't just an ordinary guy. You became very interesting, our friend Gunmin. Gunmin continues, it's not over yet. After collecting those disgusting insects, we must peel them. Horrible memories begin to flood Ma Joan's mind, and he screams desperately, telling them to wait. As they drag him back to the cabinet, his greatest trauma, Gunmin says, My friend, all that's happening now is your fault. Ma Joan asks how he could do all this, and Gunmin responds, This is my gift to you. They release several centipedes into the box where Ma Joan is trapped. Gunmin says, Let's say these are my new insect friends. Ma Joan starts screaming inside the cabinet, and Gunmin asks, What do you think of this? Do you like it? Suddenly, Gunmin becomes frightened and asks, Why isn't he responding anymore? More. Did fear eat his tongue, or is he holding back? There were several cockroaches and other insects crawling on Ma Joan's face. The other guys comment, Look how cute, he's really holding up. Another guy says, There's no point in pretending to be tough. One of the guys tells Gun Min, You feel sorry for this bastard, but remember he's a killer. Gun Min responds, A killer? This little doll? Don't make me laugh. Another guy comments, Gun Min, you really are a crazy bastard. That's why I like you. Gun Min replies, Why are you saying that? We haven't even started yet. From now now on, I'm going to make him scream until his vocal cords tear. Suddenly, the protagonist appears in their midst. One of the guys asks, What are you doing here? Another comments, Damn kid, you almost gave me a heart attack. Another says, What the hell is this bastard doing here? The protagonist, very calmly, says, hey, How are you going to make him scream like this? And lands a blow on one of the guys, knocking him down with a single punch. Another guy charges at the protagonist and says, You want to die, idiot. The protagonist replies, Scream like this, and kicks the guy in the face, slamming him into the ground. Gun Min and the other guy are stunned by the protagonist. The protagonist says, Hey, Ma Joan, I told you I would repay my debt, and I will, but let's just say my debt will be paid in a much more painful way for these guys here. The prisoners were in the cell, wondering where Ma Joan was at that moment. One of them said, Well, come to think of it, I haven't seen Ma Joan yet. Another responded that he had been called by the supervisor to help with cleaning in the wooden room. The others found it strange, as it was too late for that. One of the prisoners 
others, who had been quiet, observed everything and stood up, calling a guard. The guard replied, Hey kid, you again. What do you want? The prisoners were happy and started discussing if they would have pizza or chicken again. The protagonist, Sirius, said, Open the door now, frustrating everyone who had hoped for a feast. The guard, surprised, asked, What did you say? I didn't hear you well. The scene shifts to the protagonist facing Majum, saying he would pay his debt and telling him to stay calm. A bigger prisoner, who was with Ju Young, said, You're Ju Young, right? That cocky kid who's been causing trouble lately. When you were with Majum before, I wasn't sure, but now I'm starting to understand. You guys are pretty close, huh? Ju Young, freaking out, said, This is great. Majum has a reliable friend like this. Even I wish I had a friend like that. Another prisoner started laughing, saying Ju Young's words were annoying, and asked if he wanted to be his friend, getting ready to punch the protagonist. But the protagonist used a judo throw on the prisoner, dropping him like a doll. On the ground, the protagonist said, You and me friends, I'd rather die. Turning to Ju Young, the protagonist asked why he did this. Ju Young, serious, replied, Limits, you must be kidding. Because of that traitor, I lived in pain, pretending to be my only childhood friend while planning to betray me. At that moment, the prisoner who took the judo throw put the protagonist in a chokehold, saying he wouldn't go down easily. The protagonist thought everything led to this moment. Ju Young asked the prisoner to break the protagonist's neck, who was scared by the strength of the hold. Out of breath, he realized he couldn't escape. Suddenly, Majum appeared and ordered them to release the boy, threatening to break the bigger prisoner's neck. Ju Young was impressed by Majum's escape, but understood that the protagonist's blow had broken the locker's lock, allowing the escape. Taking advantage of the distraction, the protagonist freed himself and kicked Ju Young. The protagonist commented, That was close. I can't let my guard down like that. The prisoner, with a sore neck, complained. Ju Young, like a psychopath, ordered them to keep strangling the protagonist. Majum, pressing the prisoner's neck, threatened to break it if he continued. The protagonist, never having seen Majum so violent, was scared. Majum ordered the prisoner to relax if he didn't want to die there. The pressure from Majum made the prisoner pass out or die. It wasn't clear yet. Majum then looked directly at Ju Young, who was shocked and started apologizing, kneeling and holding Majum's foot, begging for forgiveness, claiming it was all innocent self-defense. I am, originally, a lost idiot. Please think of this as another dumb mistake I made. Please, man. Majum, very serious, replied, No, I never thought of you as an idiot. Gun Min didn't understand what he meant by that. Majum then said, Hey, Gun Min, your selfish disillusionment is gone. I ruined my whole life, and that fact won't change. I already have seven kills on my record, and I really thought a lot about what I was going to do with you here. But, looking now at what you've become, I really don't hate you. Actually, I don't hate you much, because we were friends. Gun Min was stunned by the word friends. He began to recall all the good times he had spent with Majol, but soon his psychopathic phase returned, saying, Well, that doesn't make any sense, you damn idiot. Soon, for sure, I will get my revenge on you, you bastard. But as he was finishing thinking that, the protagonist landed a kick to his face, sending him flying. The guy bounced like a tennis ball. Well, I don't know about you, but that kick was very satisfying to me. The protagonist, injured, said, Well, I said I'd handle this for you. The scene then changes, and the protagonist and Majom return to their cell. The protagonist, with his back to Majom, says, Hey, you, you really are an idiot, aren't you? And Majom says, What? Why are you saying that to me so suddenly? And he replies, Well, a killer who has murdered seven people is afraid of some stupid weakness. The guy, embarrassed, says, Man, I wasn't scared. Who said that? The protagonist then says, Man, I know. And really, I don't know what bad stuff went down between you two, but at least you don't see this guy as your real enemy, right? Majom, smiling, replies, What do you know about anything, man? The scene shifts to what happened after the protagonist knocked out Gun Min. The protagonist asks Majom, Why are you still here? Why didn't you leave? And Gun Min says, Hey, Jong, thanks a lot for helping me. The protagonist, smiling, replies, Why are you saying these things out of the blue? Suddenly, a guy appears behind the protagonist, next to Gun Min's body, saying, Gun Min, wake up now, man. The protagonist looks at the guy, wondering who he is. The guy then says, Man, why did you leave the cell without permission? You have no idea how scared I was in there. Meanwhile, Gun Min was completely out cold on the ground, unconscious. The guy starts punching Gun Min's face repeatedly, even though he was already knocked out. The guy then starts screaming that there was a huge, horrible cockroach, and no one was there to catch it, and he thought he was going to die of fright. This behavior shocks both the protagonist and Majo, as the guy's attitude changed drastically. After beating Gun Min's face to a pulp, the guy says, Damn, his blood splashed all over my face. I really hate getting dirty. This disgusting blood is full of germs. Then, with surprising speed, he grabs the protagonist's shirt. But instead of hitting him, he uses the shirt 
shirt to wipe his own face. After finishing, he looks at the protagonist with a psychopathic stare and asks, Hey, is my face clean, folks? There are only crazy people here. One is worse than the other in this prison. And that's why this story gets more interesting with each chapter. The guy starts asking even more insanely if his face is clean. The protagonist stays silent for a moment, as he's being held by this crazy guy. But then he says the guy's face is clean. However, he quickly adds, Actually, I'm lying. Your face is really dirty. The guy opens his eyes wide and says, What did you say? Even Majum is impressed by the protagonist's response. The guy, enraged, says he feels disgusting and lunges at the protagonist. But a guard appears and says, If you finish your extra work, then go back to your cells quickly. The guy then asks, What are you all doing gathered here? The crazy guy was staring at the protagonist's number, 7199. Well, we expect more trouble ahead, but that's what we like about this prison drama. If there isn't a good fight, it's not fun. The scene then shifts to the yard, where some guys are running awkwardly, like those condo guys playing soccer. The protagonist is sitting on the stairs and says, Hey, what are you guys doing here? Everyone is gathered around the protagonist. He asks why they are all around him so suddenly. One of the inmates says, Why are you asking that? We're here because you're Ju Young. The guy's name is Gu Namin, and he's in cell 36. The protagonist then observes the other inmates talking about him. Some say, Isn't that the guy who showed off in the exercise yard before? Yeah, I heard he got beat up. They say he's really strong, so let's stay away from him. The guy from cell 36 says, If I stick close to you, no one will dare to fight me. The protagonist doesn't care much and says, Do what you want. I don't care, just don't bother me. All he can think about is that he has more important things to do than wasting time there. He thinks, A blue dragon embroidered with red flowers is known as the red flower dragon, and I need to find the guys with that ridiculous tattoo. But where could those gang members be hiding? The guy next to the protagonist says, What are you looking at all the time? You always stare ahead, thinking about many things but never say anything. The protagonist replies that he's looking for something. The man says, Just tell me what it is, and I'll find it for you. I may not look it, but I'm known for my information here. Man, I know, you can't trust anyone in this place. The protagonist then says he's looking for a specific tattoo. The scene changes, and it's mentioned that young gangs committing crimes are developing. These gangs form groups systematically to extort money and goods. One of the prisoners said, Well, it's true that these news stories are out there every day. Another replied, Well, the news is based on real events. Violent acts and serious crimes among students never stop. The prisoners watching TV commented, Man, these bastards are real insane criminals. They should rot in prison for 100 years. Another prisoner responded, Geez, how can you say such harsh words? The prisoners talked about how not everyone in the cell was bad. Sometimes, they just got unlucky in life or stole something to eat when they were hungry. This guy named Gu then said, Well, let me tell you why I ended up here. Once upon a time, there was a legendary tavern in my neighborhood. I was a regular customer. The texture and chewiness of the tibak and the harmony of the seasoning were on a whole different level. But one day, a lunatic, the son of a local congressman who was a thug relying on his father's influence, showed up. This guy said, Ma'am, please give me a tibak. The scene changes to him already eating the tibak, and he says, Damn, you must be joking. This is made with rice cakes. It was said that this lunatic was really crazy. The guy then completely trashed the old lady's establishment, claiming that tibak is originally made with wheat cakes, and that jerk wrecked the shop in no time. At that exact moment, I showed up. He said the leader of tibak enthusiasts had arrived to save the day, and he claimed the fight ended in his legendary victory. He said, well, I became the tibak. Actually, no, I became the hero who protected the tebak shop. But everything has its downside, right? I ended up here all because of that lunatic who used his father's influence in Congress. But I have no regrets about what I did. The guys sitting on the floor said, Man, you're lying again, aren't you? One of the prisoners asked the protagonist, Do you know what Gu Na Min's real name is and why he lies so much? Actually, his name is Gun Min. And to explain, it's a wordplay combining his name with Gira, which means lie. The guys then said, Well, I heard he was caught lying in his previous cell and got busted for it. He still hasn't learned, has he? The guy then said, Man, what are you talking about? All my stories are based on real events. You have to believe me. The other said, Oh, sure, it's fiction. If you die, I won't believe it. The protagonist, who had been silent until now, said, Well, it doesn't seem like a lie to me. This surprised even Goo. The protagonist continued, Aphids provide sugar for ants, and the ants protect them. It's pretty much like the relationship with bullies. I can tell you that's how I've lived my whole life. The guy was so happy with the protagonist's words he couldn't express how thrilled he was. He thought, man, I could finally become Ju Young's right-hand man, and that would be really awesome. The scene shifts, and finally, spring arrived, filled with the scent of flowers. While Gun Min was tending
tending the plants, that clean freak psycho appeared behind him, and asked what he was doing there since everything smelled so bad, making gunmen so tense he couldn't even connect to Wi-Fi. He remembered being beaten by this guy once, and it was said, it's all because of your lies, you have a dirty mouth, and I'm going to clean it for you. Gunmen was shocked since they knew each other. The guy started shouting, my ex-class leader was full of germs and bacteria, they're all over my face now, I feel like my face is rotting. How disgusting. Gunmen thought, this crazy devil really has mental health issues, but why did this bastard show up here out of nowhere? Gunmen, shocked, and not knowing what to say, apologized. Man, I didn't see you there, I'm sorry. The guy then said, but can you clean this up? Gunmen replied, yes, I can clean this for you, no problem. He thought, this bastard is really a clean freak. But the guy said, well, let me clean you first. He threw some kind of poison in Gunmen's face, hitting him square in the eyes, making him writhe in pain on the ground. The psycho said, actually, I'm here to ask you something. Number 7199. Isn't he in the same room as you? Gunmen was very confused. He tried to remember who that number belonged to since it seemed very familiar. As he forced his memory, he asked, isn't that Ju Young's number? The psycho said, man, that bastard said I was dirty. I'm trying so hard to be creative and clean, and this bastard says that to me. You know, gunmen, shocked and sweating, replied, yes, I know, I know. The guy then said, so we're going together. Let's show that bastard how to sterilize and disinfect them all. As his shirt opened, we saw he had a blue dragon tattoo. You know what that means, right? A fight between him and the protagonist is guaranteed. The scene then shifts to the protagonist's cell, where he was doing one-handed push-ups. When he reached his 100th repetition, he wondered where he had seen that dragon tattoo before. He was sure he had seen it around here. One of the prisoners asked how the protagonist could have so many muscles and such motor coordination to do a one-handed push-up so easily. He then asked if the protagonist had trained in gymnastics outside of prison. The guy talking to the protagonist was Gun Min, and out of nowhere, he said, okay, let's drink some grape juice now. The protagonist was puzzled and said, what? Drinking juice out of nowhere? What are you talking about? The guy, all embarrassed, replied, isn't it good to drink grape juice after working so hard? And besides, you've been pushing yourself too much with the gymnastics. You're going to faint. It's always important to stay hydrated in this place. The protagonist then got up and said, all right then, I'll drink some. But as soon as he went to drink the grape juice, he was shocked by what he saw. The protagonist's expression quickly changed to one of anger. He turned to gun men and asked, who was the bastard that gave you insecticide for me to drink? You'd better answer me clearly. And now, and folks, here's the deal. Unfortunately, there are no more chapters of this story. I wanted to make a much longer video for you, but there simply aren't any more chapters. However, I saw that you really, really like this story. I know you'll be sad about this, but let's do the following. If this video gets 500 likes, just like the other videos, as soon as the next chapters are released, I'll bring them as quickly as possible. I'll release them here right away. And just a heads up, subscribe and turn on the notification bell because YouTube doesn't always deliver the videos and you might miss this part. I also hope the upcoming stories are as incredible as this one. But that's it. Thank you for watching until now. See you in the next video and take care.